Hello, children of the Most High, ever-loving, living God. Welcome back to Marie Speaks God's Grace Bible Study. Today, we are going to be getting into the book of Deuteronomy, Devarim, chapter 26. I hope everyone gets something out of this Bible study. I truly hope and pray others enjoy. And I pray that others like, heart, and share. Amen and amen. Thank you for watching this video. We are currently in season 5.5 of Marie Speaks God's Grace Bible Study for the time being until we officially begin season 6. We will not be um, doing the Jewish terminology word of the week, nor will we... Um, be doing the sorry I want to double check the connection nor will we be doing <laughs> trying to type and speak at the same time is not very fun um, nor will we be doing uh, the Bible study trivia questions or the Jewish and American history facts, which everyone knows by now is my absolute favorite. I absolutely, positively love doing research and looking at history and finding out fun, <laughs> wonderful facts that I didn't know before. Oh. It just makes me so happy to be able to go and do research over and over. Anyhow, so we are also not currently doing any of the weekly broadcasts except for right now we're trying to be live and do live broadcastings. Um, so yeah, so here we go. We are going to be going into Deuteronomy chapter 26, and I entitled this Bible study, Call Out to Hashem Your God, an Armenian tried to kill my, tried to destroy my forefather, O Hashem. So I hope others enjoy this and they get something out of it and they like it. And it's my understanding it isn't streaming. So if it doesn't stream, don't worry. It's recording and I will upload it later. Okay, here we go. So let's go to the website. What you see on the website, on the screen before you is our website, mariespeaksgodsgrace.live because we serve a living God. And if you click on the tab that says season 5.5, you will see our latest and greatest blog that are meant to go in conjunction with our live or uploaded um, Bible study broadcasts. Oh, this is fun. All right. So this lesson, we're going to continue with the second servant of Moshe of Ainu's speech to the nation of Israel before his death and the nation of Israel carrying on into the promised land. And this lesson, we'll be going over a portion of a portion, Ki Tavo. And this half Torah for this portion is Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 through 22. So we are starting with this chapter, a new portion of a portion. As I said before, I entitled this Bible study, Deuteronomy chapter 26, Call out to Hashem your God, an Armenian tried to destroy my father, O Hashem. Why did I entitle this Bible study like this? I'm glad you asked. Oftentimes, we are told not to 
hold grudges or in our anger do not sin, many say, right? We might even be told that showing a degree of emotion or troubles is, or we might be told um, showing a degree of emotion and troubles is discouraged. Yet, often here in the text, we are being instructed by Hashem, blessed be He, to remember or to recall how another group of people, a nation, a goyim, um, oppressed use their oppressive governmental system run by a bunch of pagan heathens <laughs> and their unelected supporters who afflicted our ancestors. It is not just affliction, but also the imposition of imposition of excessive taxes, poisoning of our people, murder of our people, infocide of our people, harsh and brutal, dangerous, overwork camps, corrupt wars, sexual perversion, and enslavement among other atrocities that are often done against our people. So weird, and honestly, it sounds oddly familiar. Am I right? Am I right? But, as they say, there are no coincidences. Now, all that being said, if, if God repeats himself, then it is important. In yesterday's Bible study, Devarim, chapter 25, we ended with God commanding us to remember how the Amalekites afflicted our people at our weakest point in time when we were heading out in an exodus from the land of Egypt. They hit us from behind when we were not expecting it. And he not only wanted us to recall it, but obviously to recall it, we would have to tell this to the later generations so that they can be able to recall it. You know that word forever, right? So I'm sure forever to happen, something needs to pass on. Now, I don't believe and I'm not even going to dare ex um, suggest that our God wants us to be hateful or act out of hate. Absolutely 100% no. We definitely should never aim to cause anyone harm or injury or any other discomfort out of hate. There is, though, a such thing as righteous anger or righteous hatred, okay? There's evil and there's good. There's positive and there's negative. What we choose to do for the glory of the living God by His honor and His direction should always be heading towards righteousness. This should be our whole goal, right? When it says, call out to the Lord your God, fear the Lord your God, seek the Lord your God, listen to His leaders that are given His counsel to communicate His direction to the congregation, us. This is what we're supposed to do. So, I do believe Anger and hatred has its place in that sense. And we're going to read about this in Tehillim, Psalms 37. Here we go. Of David, a Psalm of David. Do not be vexed by evil men. Do not be incensed by wrongdoers. For they soon wither like grass. Like verdure fade away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Abide in the land and remain loyal. Seek the favor of the Lord, and He will grant you the desires of your heart. Leave all to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do it. He will cause your vindication to shine forth like the light, the justice of your case, like the noonday sun. 
Be patient and wait for the Lord. Do not be vexed by prop by purposing men who carries out his schemes. Give up anger. Abandon fury. Do not be vexed. It can only do harm. Now, the word of vexed is being repeated here. Vexed is often used in hexes and vexes, in spells and lines and schemes, which is associated with witchcraft and sorcery. Okay? When someone aims to harm someone, lie, cheat, or steal, they are at the base level aiming to control another individual and take away their free will which Hashem gives us it's by God right they are aiming to control an individual by concealment of truth means they are not divulging freely the information it is also known as trickery or magic, pharmakia, sorcery. It's all under this control abusiveness umbrella. Okay? Now, in the book of Enoch, chapter 6, which not all subscribe to and not very many enjoy reading, but I'm going to bring it up again. It talks about how the angels who chose to leave the habitation of heaven and someone into the daughters of men, how 200 of them were running around using their supernatural abilities, their influences to violate trick lie and deceive into sexual perversion the daughters of men and in doing so they defiled themselves not just for and by in the act of going into the daughters of men did they defile themselves but because they chose to leave the mindset connected to god the mindset for lack of a better word being yoked, being echad, being one with the mind of God. They chose to leave that state of being, and for lack of a better word, lower themselves into the evilness that they knew of, right? Because they know of those things, because they're spiritual beings. They chose to enter into the mindset of evilness, of witchcraft and sorcery. And then when they came down, they taught this evilness to the humans. This is where we get the word vexed from. And I know some can talk about the strong concordance and Latin this and Greek that and Hebrew this. Absolutely 100%. But this is the spirit of vexed. So when someone or when the Torah and Tanakh says and don't vex, don't vex, don't be vex, don't give in to someone's sorcery and witchcraft. Don't give in to curses spoken, God forbid, over you or anyone you know. And also we aren't to curse, right? We aren't to vex others. We aren't to vex the newcomer, the stranger, someone something not like us. You see? Giving in to vex is allowing oneself, for an example, to get irrational and over-emotional about a situation. Now, I'll use me as an example. I used to allow myself to get vexed when others would point out how different I was compared to them or to the status quo that was going on. I upset their understanding of Judaism or a person returning and wanting to be observant. And I didn't look something like what they had been taught. A quote-unquote 
brown Jew looks and talks like because they were used to, you know, those Mitrahi uh, Sephardic Jews in a box. And according to them, and if you weren't in a big city and you weren't going to a huge synagogue, you had no way of being able to observe Orthodox Judaism. It was just not possible in their mind. Then, on the other hand, I was in a small town and I... (laughs) No, I did not look like anything or anyone that was there. It was obvious I had moved there. Let's just say that. And many of the individuals, not a lot, not all of them, but many made it perfectly known. In fact, one is far to ask, why did I dress the way that I did? How could I possibly be able to afford to live in their neighborhood? Oh yes, I got asked that question. What do I do to earn money? You know, just ill-bred ill-educated, invasive, rude questioning. And it happens everywhere. You know, some people are just ill-mannered. It doesn't matter their quote-unquote degree or education level or their family background. Some people may be quote-unquote well-bred and have a pedigree, but they ain't got no common sense. And I allowed this to vex me. It bothered me. It did. And it overwhelmed me. And then I would be like, God, why? Why are these people so freaking stinking annoying that just my mere presence seems to annoy them? Just me dressing modest seems to offend them. Just me not doing the things that they do or believing the things that they believe in, but yet still being kind and and doing my best to be approachable and get along with them, somehow that was offensive to them. See, it took me a while, um, because sometimes I'm a slow learner, to realize they weren't really asking me why I was so different than them. They were vocalizing towards me their question to their self. Why are they so different than me if, quote unquote, we believe in the same God? You see that? I think many individuals, and this happens wherever you go, I don't care who you are, they seem to forget When we were standing at Mount Sinai, there was a variety of individuals there. Some of them had the blood of Abraham still flowing through their beautiful veins. Some were of the stock of Abraham, to say. Some of them were of the stock of Isaac, and some of them were of the stock of Jacob. Some of them were of the stock of Noah. Some of them were of the stock of whoever else went round about after Babylon and then realized their error and wanted to come back to the great and only living God. And they saw through all the beautiful signs and wonders of the Ted Plagues, right? They came from Alaska. They came from China. They came from Russia. They came from the South, the North Pole. They came from the inner earth. They came from the stars above. I don't know where they were. They came from Atlantis too. Let's throw that out there. And after they climbed out of the Grand Canyon and made their way to Israel, right? And they're standing and looking around. They're like, I hear that hot at Sinai and there's a grouping and God's presence is there. Let's go there too. And then they all meet Moshe Avenu and the, he tells them about the only living God and, and what he has done for them, right? And even the father-in-law of Moshe Avenu came. Because he witnessed it too. So there was an array, a beautiful array 
of different individuals there from all different cultures, from all around the world. Some might say, as it is written, from four corners of the earth. Wanting to give over, not their wallet, not their genital parts, but their heart, their soul, their beautiful spirit, their devotion to the only pure and living God. You see this? This is what they wanted. And many of us in Judaism seem to forget this. It doesn't matter how firm or relax or flexidox or liberal they are. Many forget that every and anyone who was willing to turn to Hashem during the time of the Exodus was there at Har Sinai. Now, should I allow someone's ignorance and lack of education or lack of belief in what is written in Hashem's Torah to take me off of my path with Him? Should you allow this? Should you or I allow myself to be vexed? You see, that makes no sense. Because of their ignorance, I'm going to lessen my love for Hashem because of their lack of trust, because of their lack of belief in Torah, because they don't have a certificate or can see a family tree. Should I and you allow their willful and intentional ignorance to affect me should it affect how i eat should it affect how i walk how i talk should it affect how often i pray i i'm gonna guess that most people out there are saying absolutely no why would i let a complete and utter stranger have that much control over me i'm free I have been set free. This is what it means to not let yourself be vexed. Give up anger. Give and abandon fury. Do not allow yourself to be under the control of anybody. It doesn't matter their name, their bank account level, their group of friends, their whatever title they think they have, or their mob and wolf mentality. Do not allow yourself to be vexed. Why? Because it can only do harm and take you off of your path that the creator of the universe has said you are the one the only one worthy of walking remove your sandals for you are standing on holy ground think about that mm. for evil man will be cut off but those yes those who look to the lord Shall they shall inherit the land a little longer and there will be no wicked man. You will look at where he was and he will be gone. But the lonely, yes, the lonely shall inherit the land and delight in the abundant well-being will being of mind, body, heart, soul, and spirit. The wicked man and the schemes against the righteous and the gashing of his teeth at him, the Lord laughs at him. <laughs> he knows that his day will come. And the wicked, they draw their swords, they bend their bows to bring down the lowly and the needy, 
to slaughter the upright man. Their swords, hmm, the swords shall pierce their own hearts and their bows shall be broken. Now the swords could be the words of their mouth, their lan shara that they speak, lahan shara that they speak, their lies, the traps that they set. Huh? Because what they send out onto others is really curses that will return to them. Because you cannot curse anyone. Witches and warlocks, they know this. Whatever curses you sign out will come back to you tenfold. This is why we should never curse. Wiccans, little light witches, which all, all sorcery is against God, just so we're clear. They know this. You see? This is why God commands us, in your anger, do not sin. Do not speak evil. Do not curse. Because he's protecting us. Their swords shall pierce their own hearts and their bows shall be broken. Whatever they send out to attempt to harm us, God forbid, in any way, shape, or form, it will fall to naught. It will not even reach us. It may go to our left and to our right, but it will not come to our doorstep. Better the little that the righteous man has than the great abundance of, a, of the wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord is the support of the righteous. Not the perfect, because no one's perfect. But the righteous, those who try to do good, those who have a heart and a mind to do good. The Lord is concerned for all the needs of the blameless. Their portion is forever. They shall not come to grief in bad times. In famine, they shall eat their feel. Has anyone noticed even during these times? They are somehow still able to eat well, right? Somehow you still have enough or even more than enough. And it's not to be arrogant or... um. Try and put others down. This is not what that is. But it's showing the heart and mind of God for you. Even though evil, disgusting, foul, demonic people are doing their best to try to afflict the children of God at whatever level they are at, they are still a child of God. And God's hand has never been cut short. God will continue to support the righteous. Mm. The Lord is concerned for the needs of the blameless. Their portion lasts forever. They shall not come to grief in bad times. In famine, they shall eat their fill, but the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord shall be consumed. Like meadow grass consumed in smoke. The wicked man borrows and does not repay. Because he is a liar who makes these vows. And he has no intention, right? Unfulfilling his vows. God hates this. We went over that yesterday. The righteous is generous. So even though they might be, God forbid, struggling... Even though their money might be jingle jingling and not folding at this time. The righteous still keeps giving. The righteous still is generous with kindness, with volunteering, with effort. Those blessed by God shall inherit the land. 
but those cursed by him, hmm, they shall be cut off. Now, this could be a spiritual cutting off, or this could be a physical cutting off at the tribe. Now, some might be wondering why some have to return to Judaism. Why do some have to convert even though maybe their great or great great grandparents, mother or father, whichever one, was Jewish? Shouldn't they just be able to step right in? Well, see, this goes into curse and cuts off. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but we've talked about it briefly before, and I just want to basically review. In one's lifetime, if some individual, God forbid, commits enough grievous sins, correct sins, if they continue to rebel against God, if they take the Lord's name in vain, if they lie, cheat, commit adultery, you know, we went over it yesterday. If they are unrepented in this life, and their life, God forbid, is cut short, when they come back again and they have to review the next life, they will be given an opportunity to correct the deficiencies that cause their previous life to end before they were able to fulfill their mission for Hashem and His glory. If at their repeated lifetimes they continue to do this, this is when they can be cut off for the tribe and born, born in that lifetime in body a non-Jew, a religious non-Jew, or born with some kind of, I want to say this softly and gently, and I mean it with a good heart. They could be, for, be born with some kind of, God forbid, ailment or deficiency or deformity. This is what it means to be cut off. But it's all relative to whichever sin they committed in their previous life. That's a spiritual teaching. So if someone is wondering, I feel a strong connection to, I don't know, Europe. That's probably because maybe you have ancestors from Europe. Maybe in one of your previous lives, you actually lived in Europe. So you have to do your own research in that. If someone is wondering why certain issues exist in their life, and it possibly existed in their parents' life and so on, maybe that's showing a generational sin that needs to be broken in Hashem's glorious name. How do you turn away from an ancestral sin? We'll go over this more when we go over the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28, the curses portion, verses 15 through 69. And we're going to talk a little bit of how to break those ancestral sins. But at the basic level, it's this. Learn good. Do good. Turn away from evil. That's it. If your great-great-grandfather was Billy the Kid. <laughs> and we, most of us might remember the history of Billy the Kid. He was a bank robber. He was an infinite bank robber. But you know what else he was? He was a terrorizer, right? It might be scary to get uh, having the train robbing and the bank robbing, right? So not only was he a bank robber, but he was a terrorizer. Well, he was also kind of like a famous um, influencer of that time for bank robberies. So he encouraged others to sin and be lawless. So he was an intimidator. He was a terrorist. He was a bad example. He used his position and influence for negative in, um, instances against God. And he was a lawless man. Right there, there's five categories that if you are an ancestor, a Billy the Kid, that you need to repent for in this lifetime to remove that ancestral curse from you if 
in this lifetime, God forbid you have money woes and money's issues and somehow people keep stealing your stuff. It's probably because of what your ancestor Billy the Kid did or maybe you reincarnated Billy the Kid and now you got some atonement to make. You see, this is what it means. He, he shall be cut off. And for the feminists out there, God is fair. <laughs> Him can sometimes mean someone in a power and a position of authority because it has to do with the mantle and the appointment. Hence, when God says, I know him by name, I know him by title. You see? All right. Those blessed by him shall inherit the earth and those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of men are made firm by God, the Lord. When he delights in his ways, though he stumbles, he does not fall. For the Lord gives him support. I have been young, and now I am old. But I have never seen a righteous man abandoned, not by God, hallelujah, or the righteous man's children seeking for bread. He is always generous and lends and his children are held blessed here we go you hear this this is how we return to hashem wherever whoever you are shun evil do good and you shall abide how long forever Forever, ever, ever, and forever, ever, ever, never ends. For the Lord loves what is right. He does not abandon his faithful ones. No, they are preserved forever. While the children of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous shall inherit their land and abide in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom. Not curses, not hate, not jealousy, not Lashon Hurrah, not singling out an individual. And he uses his tongue and he speaks what is right. The teachings of his God is in his heart. His feet do not slip. The wicked watches for the righteous, seeking to put him to death. But the Lord, the Lord will not abandon him to his power. He will not let him be condemned in judgment. Look, look to the Lord and keep his ways. And he will raise you high that you may inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I saw a wicked man, powerful, well-rooted, like a robust native tree suddenly he vanished and he was gone i sought him but he was not to be found mark the blameless note the upright for there is a future for the man of integrity but transgressors they shall be utterly destroyed the future of the wicked shall be cut off. The deliverance of the righteous comes from the Lord. Their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them. The Lord rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and he delivers them. For they seek the refuge of him and him alone. Amen and amen. Now, isn't that beautiful to hear? Isn't that wonderful to know that the Lord our God is always with us no matter what? Through good and bad times, He finds a way. For with Him, anything and everything is possible. This is Hashem, the only living God. See, Hashem, he does not need man's approval to be God. I know some think he needs their approval, 
Some think without their say so, God can't bless you, but that isn't the case. God is a sovereign. Hear me. Hear me, children of God. God is a sovereign ruling God. Hmm. He does not need anyone's approval to do what he's going to do or go where he's going to go or bless who he is going to bless and protect those who he is going to protect and rise up who he is going to raise up. You hear this, children of God? Some think that he needs their permission, but I assure you, in the Torah... In the Tanakh, it says different. Now, there are certain laws for certain times and certain places, and that's why it is important for us to research our history, document it, write it down, and share it with the next generation. The evil ones want to take away our heritage. They want us to forget who and where we came from. They want us to not know our mother tongue, whichever it was, when, you know, we were sent away <laughs> after the whole Babylon thing, right? They, they don't want us to know. But I want to encourage others. Find out. Seek it out. Ask God to lead and guide you. Research your history. And don't just keep it electronic. Because we've seen what can happen with electronic stuff. Document it. Write it down. God told them in the book of Numbers. Write this down. And this is something me and you should do too. We went over some of the laws of when and when they're required. In the land of Israel, when we were studying Devarim chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. So if others would like to check out that class, the link is on the blog. Now, we're going to go over a Tehillim that reviews the place and time for righteous anger. Now, in the land, there are certain commandments. And when Hashem calls us to remember the affliction that the Amalekites did to our ancestors, right? He recalls us to have righteous anger and to pass on the remembrance of what the wicked will do when they see you at your so on so wicked point. Remember this. Teach it to your young how long? Forever. Now, in Tehillim or Psalm 139, it reads this. For the leader of David, a psalm. O Lord, you have examined me and know me. When I sit down or when I stand up, you know it. You discern my thoughts from far away. You observe my walking and my reclining and are familiar in all my ways. There is not a word on my tongue. There is not a word on my tongue that you, O Lord, Know it well. You hedge me before and behind, and you lie your hand upon me. It is beyond my knowledge. It is a mystery. I cannot fathom it. Where can I escape from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heavens, hallelujah, 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 there you are. If I descend to Shoel, <laughs> there you are too. If I take wing withdrawn and, and come to rest on the western horizon, even there your hand will be guiding me. Oh yes. Your hand will be holding me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will conceal me, night will provide me with cover. Hmm. Darkness is not too dark for you. Night is as light as day and darkness and light are the same. It is you. You who created my conscience. 
You, you fashioned me in my mother's womb. I praise you. For I am awesomely, wonderfully made. Your work is wonderful. I know it very well. Your frame is not concealed from me. When I was a shape in a hidden place, knit together in the recess of the earth, your eyes saw me unformed limbs. Your eyes saw my unformed limbs. They were all recorded in your book. In due time, they were formed to the very last one of them. How weightly your thoughts seem to me, O oh God. How great their number. To count them, they exceeded the grains of sand. I end. But still, I am with you. Hmm. O oh God, if you would only slay the wicked, you murderers, away from me. You who invoke you for intrigue. Your enemies who swear by you falsely, O oh Lord, I know I hate those who hate you. I loathe your adversaries. I feel a perfect hatred towards them, and I count them my enemies. Examine me, O Lord, know my mind, probe me, and know my thoughts. See if I have vexation ways, and guide me in ways everlasting. I love this psalm. It puts together the explanation of the vexation of hatred of the witchcraft and sorcery part, right? The spiritual teaching. But it also brings to light the power of righteous anger and righteous hatred. We should hate what is evil. If we do not hate what is evil, we are co-signing what is evil and what is against God. God forbid. You see couple months ago there were a bunch of men in dresses dancing around in the middle of the streets in public for all to see young and old in the cradle in the womb and outside of the womb beautiful little children were taken by those who do not hate evil by those who do not hate wicked ways. Those who would dare insult the covenant of being a parent. Took their precious sweet innocent little children to watch men. Some of them bare naked in the middle of the street. Gyrating and, act and acting perverse and sexually in front of them. Those people weren't parents. Those people were nothing more than madams and pimps looking to whore out and prostitute their children. Looking to violate their innocence. Looking to make their children find agreement with evil and wickedness as they have. That's what happens when you don't hate evil. That's what happens when you don't know what is good and what is evil because you don't have a moral compass. You don't have a moral foundation. Does this mean you have to be religious? To recognize what is good and what is evil. I'm going to put it out there. I don't believe anyone has to be religious. To have a strong moral compass. I don't think you have to be religious. To know what is good 
and discern what is evil. I don't believe you have to be someone who goes to a synagogue each and every day or even know how to pray from a sitter. I don't believe this. What the Torah says in order to know what is good and what is evil, you have to know God. That is not religion. That is relationship. That is not thinking. That is knowing. When we know someone, it is a part of our being. It is a vital part of our daily life and daily existence, dare I say. When we know God and we acknowledge and accept Him as our King and the ruler of our life, the creator of our very breath, that is our foundation. And then we apply his beautiful laws, his guidance, his instruction of his protection and for his protection to our lives wherever we are in the world. That doesn't require religion. That requires knowing God. And that's why the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 could be for any and everyone who knows him by name. Hashem, the only living God. I will be what I will be. I am who I am. Hallelujah. Yes and amen. Now, if the blessings... <laughs> Are for anyone who knows the name of the living God. Guess what the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 16 through 69 are for. You don't need religion for it. I'm going to give everyone a hint. Everyone. <laughs> I cheat. Sorry. But everyone who can receive the blessing is also eligible for curses. And you don't have to be religious for this. You don't have to have a mother of whatever bloodline or background. You don't have to have a father of whatever bloodline and background. You don't have to have a job or a booming bank account. You just have to be someone who does not hearken unto the voice of the Lord our God. That is not religion. That is relationship. If you don't have a relationship built on the foundation of the word of God and you act against his ways, you open yourself up to curses. Now, one of my favorite proverbs for this is Proverbs chapter 6. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Ooh, y'all. My son, if you have stood surely for your fellow, giving your hand to another, you have been trapped by the words of your mouth, snared by the words of your mouth. Do this then, my son. To extricate yourself to remove yourself from the obligation of having to take from up for someone else who did not want to be in line with the word of god this is basically what it's saying you took on a debt for them you took on a sin for them you vouched for them knowing they deserved some judgment you wanted to quote unquote save them mm -mm -mm. For you have come into the power of your fellow. You have allowed yourself to be vexed. Go grovel and badger your fellow. Give your eyes no sleep, your pupils no slumber. Save yourself like a deer out of the hand of the hunter, like a bird out of the hand of a fowler. Lazy bones go to the ant. Study its ways and learn. Without lenders, officers, or rulers, it lies up in its doors during the summer. It gathers its food at the harvest. How long will you lie there, lazy bones? When will you wake from your sleep? A bit more sleep, a bit more slumber, a bit more hugging yourself in bed? And poverty will come 
calling upon you and want. Like a man with a shield, a scoundrel, an evil man lies by, lives by crooked speech, winking his eyes, shuffling his feet, pointing his finger, blaming everyone else. For his discomfort and his and his woes and his troubles, knowing good and well all those troubles that he done got are something he brought upon himself through his wickedness, his laziness, his, his inactivity, his complacency, letting others pay for his sins, going around making children by six, seven, eight different baby mamas, her too, stop. Blaming everyone else of why you can't keep or hold down a job. Stop. Hating others. Calling everyone else racism when it's you who's racist. Stop. You see what I mean? Being biased. Taking a bribe. Being a bully. All this goes under that. Duplicity is in his heart. He plots evil all the time. He incites quarrels. Oh yes. Therefore, hear this, if the blessings are for anyone who knows of the name of the living God, and the curses are for anyone who denies following his ways and knowing his name. Therefore, calamity will come upon him without warning. Suddenly, he will be broken beyond repair. Six things the Lord hates. The Lord despises. The Lord loathes. Seven are abomination to him. A haughty bearing. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A mind that hatches evil plots. Feet quick to run to evil. A false witness testifying lies and one who incites brothers to quarrel my son keep your father's commandment do not forsake the teachings of your mother tie them over your heart always bind them around your throat when you walk it will lead you when you lie down it will watch over you when you awake, it will talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp. It teaches light. And the way of life is the rebuke that disciplines. It will keep you from an evil woman. From the smooth tongue of a forbidden woman. From the lust of her beauty. Or let her captivate you with her eyes. Don't do it. Don't let her lust of her beauty. Don't let her captivate you with your eyes. The last loaf of bread will go for a harlot. A married woman will snare a person of honor. Can a man rake embers? into a bosom without burning his clothes? Can a man walk on live coals without scorching his feet? It is the same with one who sleeps with his fellow's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. A thief is not held in contempt for stealing to appease his hunger, yet if caught he must pay seven folds. He must give up all he owns. He who commits adultery is devoid of sense. Only one who would destroy himself does such a thing. He will meet with disease and disgrace. His reproach will never be expunged. The fury of the husband will be passionate, and he will show no pity on the day of vengeance. He will not have any regard for any ransom. He will refuse your bribe, 
however great. Ooh, y'all. The blessings are those who know the Lord and call out to him by name. And the curses are for those who go against the Lord our God in all his ways. It doesn't require a religion. It requires a relationship. Clearly the text here, there is a form or a cause or a situation of a purpose of righteous anger. There is a reason why the righteous are called to remember the affliction and the afflictor. There is nothing in me that will ever believe Almighty God when creating us in His beautiful, glorious, and holy image for His honorable, righteous, beautiful service meant for us to be someone's whipping boy or someone's rug to be walked all over or treaded upon. This is why He commands us to remember those who afflicted us, those who were our afflictors, and not to allow ourselves be vexed by it, but to remember it. I believe that we are to be living with controlled strength in Hashem, led by His beautiful Ruhak, His wind, His breath, His spirit, His supernatural being, the Ruhak de Hashem, the Ruhak Elohim in the Torah, as it is called. In Ikrev chapter 10 of Devarim, we talked about this. How just because someone has a certain bloodline doesn't mean they're in the covenant of Hashem. Because you cannot buy your way into the covenant of Hashem. You cannot sleep your way. Meaning sexual perversions, adultery, whatever else. Into the covenant of Hashem. No. Hashem wants your heart. Your relationship. As it is written in Tehillim, Psalm 3, a psalm by David when he fled from his son Absalom. O Lord, my foes are so many. Many are those who attack me. Many say of me, there is no deliverance for him through God. Shalah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory. He who holds my head high, I cry aloud to the Lord and he answers me, hallelujah, from his holy mountain, shalah. I lay down to sleep and I awake again, for the Lord sustains me. I have no fear of the myriad of forces, the array that is against me on either side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me. Oh my God, for you slapped all my enemies on the face, saying you broke the teeth of all the wicked. Deliverance is the Lord. Your blessings be upon all your people. Shalom. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, yeah. I love these psalms. I'm looking forward to next season. All right. So that being said, in the coming years and times, I encourage others to take up and read the Tehillims of Hashem, those written by King David and others, and see how we can apply these Tehillims and prayers to our lives. Because God wants a relationship with you, with me, with everybody. Excuse me, let me take a sip of water. Mm hmm Oh, thank you, merciful Hashem. I forgot I had tea. <laughs> thank you, Hashem, for fragrant spices. I'm in and I'm in. Ooh, herbs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hashem, for the herbs. But you know what I mean? He wants a relationship with us. So we need to do our part and go out and seek him. All right. So before we get into reading the Bible verses, we need to do a blessing of a Torah. I do these blessings during my morning prayers and to avoid leading in others into incorrect uh, practices, we are going to do the blessing of a Torah because it is a mitzvah, a commandment of Jewish law, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, 
for our God, right? In a fulfillment of such commandments, because it is the Lord our God who gave this commandment. And it is a worthy deed. Amen. Thank you, Hashem. So, let's say the blessing of the Torah together. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Hallelujah. Mm -mm -mm. King of the universe, my Hashem. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to be engrossed in the words of his Torah. Hashem, our God, please make the words of your Torah pleasant in our mouths, in the mouth of all your people, Israel. And may we, our children, and our children's children, and the children of our children, all know your name, the house of Israel, and know your name and, and be students of your Torah simply for its own sake. Blessed are you, Hashem, who teaches the Torah to its people, Israel. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who chooses us from all among the nation and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, giver of the Torah. Blessing before reading the Torah. Bless the Lord who is blessed. Bless the Lord who is blessed for all eternity. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all among the nations and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem our God, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. All right. So all of the links that I use from the blog are on the blog. Again, you can go to the blog off of our website, Marie Speaks God's Grace, because we serve a living God. Go under the season 5.5 tab, and you can click there and see our latest and greatest blog that is meant to go in conjunction with our live or upload Bible studies. Let's get in to this portion of a portion of the book of Deuteronomy chapter 26 verses 1 through 10. Now the underlinings that are done in this Bible study I underlined to show emphasis and importance. Amen. All right. Now it shall be when you enter into the land of Israel, right? That Hashem your God is giving you as an inheritance and you possess it and settle in it. And you take it from the primer part of all the fruit of the ground that you have produced from your land that Hashem your God is giving you. You are to put it in a basket and you are to go to the place that Hashem your God chooses to have his name dwell. The Shekhanah, the Hashem, right? His beautiful spirit, his beautiful presence. Uh, will most likely be shining down like a pillar of light like it did in biblical times. But who knows, Hashem could make his presence known however he chooses to be or do when it happens maybe soon in our day. The rebuilding of the tabernacle. You are to come there to the priests in those days. You are to say to him, I announce today that I announce today to Hashem, your God, that I have entered the land that Hashem has sworn to my fathers to give to me. Then the priest is to take the basket from your hand and is to deposit it before the altar of Hashem, your God. And then you are to speak up and say before the presence of your God, an Armenian afflict, a flight, my ancestor. He went down to Egypt and so journeyed there as men folk, few in number, but he became there a great nation, great mighty in number, many. Now the Egyptians dealt ill with us and afflicted us and placed upon us hard servitude. So we cried out to Hashem, our God, God of our fathers, and Hashem hearkens to our voice and saw the affliction And our strain and our oppression and Hashem took us out of Egypt with a strong hand and outstretched arm, with a great awe-inspiring axe and with signs and portents. And he brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hallelujah. So now, here... 
I have brought the premier part of my fruits of the ground, and I have given them. Oh, Hashem. Hallelujah. Then you are to posit it before the presence of Hashem, your God, and bow down before the presence of your God. Now, some versions of the Tanakh or Torah will say, and prostate yourself, which is to lie um, with the whole frontal surface of your body directly onto the ground. Some say this. All right. So on here we read, and I underlined the portions that we read about the land of the Israel, right? The important parts. And we read about how we might have to, you know, possibly travel a distance. Now for others, it might be over land, sea, or river to get to Israel maybe soon in our days that was promised to our forefathers but other covenants were made so some of us are going to be in the land of israel right god knows and some of us may be the land that was promised to us like what um happened with noah when god said go forth be fruitful and multiply and go replenish the earth Again, again, <laughs> but this time do it more right, right? <laughs> Something like yes. So we have to research our heritage and know where so we can have an idea of what land we are supposed to take when everything happens. I'm not a quote unquote end of times expert. I find it interesting. I like to listen to studies and, and lessons that others put together. But in my unprofessional opinion, no one really knows how it's going to happen or how it's going to come about. It will just happen when it is supposed to happen because the Lord our God is the one who made the assignments or allotments of land. Amen. So... That's one factor, but those of us who believe we will someday be in Israel or Jerusalem or those roundabout expanded parts, because that's supposed to happen too, we might want to start doing our research now. So the second question one might ask or one might question, would it be brave and due diligence in our gardens now for us to carry out these commands that we might not be officially in the land that the, la the Lord our God has promised to our ancestors? We might be living in Idaho, but the land that the Lord our God promised us is in Europe. We might be living in Russia, but the land that the Lord our God promised us is at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And we can't go there because the government done let it flood with water by building all the dams because they're trying to crowd and take away the ancient sacred land that was given to our ancestors that they call Native American Indians or Indigenous Americans. You see what I'm saying? So... This might be a question. Well, my next question is, would the present or current leaders of a synagogue, a rabbi or a priest or holy of our holy blessed one, if an individual from their congregation actually followed through with this command, would they want or know what to do? And I say this kind of tongue in cheek only because we've seen a rise in these days of individuals having home gardens or balcony gardens and producing their own fruit and vegetables and vegetable trees and this and that. And I often wonder when they plant that tree or if that uh, fruit tree or vegetable garden was already established on the land before they moved in, rented or bought, if they had the pure intention of dedicating the land to Hashem, did they, while they were also putting up the mezuzah, make sure to anoint the ground with oil on a stone that was unhewed and dedicated to Hashem? Did they set up that pillar for Hashem? And did they mark the date and time so they can begin counting the years, right? You do it three years and then you can reap on the fourth. And then the seventh year is the sabbatical year for the land. I wonder this, right? 
Um, I wonder also when this happens, if if the if it's not happening at the synagogue, it's because the people who have these means, I don't know if they have chickens, goats, cows, they're not putting these into practice while they are in dysphoria, right? When they are outside of the land of Israel. Well, many of our sages teach us our time outside of the land of Israel is because we have been cut off from the tribe that is actually in Israel. See, when God says, and you will be cut off, if you are in dysphoria, you have been cut off from the land of Israel to a certain degree, because if not, you would be there. So there is a vast degree of spiritual cut offness, <laughs> for lack of, obviously, lack of a better word. Over 70% of the Jews that are in existence today live in America. I would say that's a lot of cutoffness, right? While we are here in America or other areas, wherever you are doing it up, we are supposed to be practicing the laws of the land that the Lord our God has given us. So when he takes us there before his eye, before our very eyes, from all over the four corners of the earth, we are ready to set forth and begin the actual application of God's laws. This is why God wants us studying his Torah at bare minimum three times a week. Many of us don't do this though. Many of us, I'm going to dare say, have a good time reading the Torah. Many of us enjoy the privileges of what it means to be a Jew. Many of us enjoy the entitlement, quote unquote, entitlement that they feel they have by being the chosen of the chosen, the firstborn of the firstborn, the child of the living God. Many of us enjoy this. But, sadly, there are so many, 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 many of it who use their relationship with God in an abusive manner. And, sadly, many of them don't believe in what they read, study, or are taught in or at synagogue or even when they study at home or in groups. Oh, you, you disagree with this. You do. Well, let's put this to a challenge. I challenge others out there. If you met or you know someone who believes in study Torah and they happen to have a garden or animals or wealth or whatever it is, their first fruits that God has overwhelmingly abundant with. Are they counting the times and seasons and years to be able to fill up in whatever in an impressive, beautiful basket to take it to the synagogue and present it but before the rabbi and priest? Are they writing down what they're supposed to say when they present this basket? And if and when they do, does a rabbi or priest of the synagogue know what to do when this is done? I ask this question. Now, if the answer is, I don't have a farm or I don't have animals or a garden, obviously this commandment doesn't apply to you. Not all commandments apply to everyone because not everyone is a gardener. Not everyone is a farmer, even during the times of the land of Israel in biblical times. Not everyone was. Some were clothes makers, though. So they were required to give their finest, freshly garments and present them at the tabernacle. You hear? Some of them were poets. Some of them were scribes. Some of them were teachers. Some of them were judges. Some of them were transporters. They built the wheels for wagons. Some of them built the shoes the pins for the animals. Everyone did something. Dude, they present at least one-tenth of the best of what they could do to God 
in whatever way they could beautifully apply these commandments of Hashem? And did they take that 10% to the priests at the tabernacle? The Kohanim? The descendants of Eharan? Did they do this? I'm going to guess they did because they didn't want to be cut off. Now, since we are in dysphoria, at least over 70%, are we doing this? Are we taking our best to the synagogues and presenting it before the rabbis? Hmm. That's an interesting question and challenge, is it? Below are links to the videos regarding covenants of Hashem. And disclaimer, these classes were done when I was going through that whole Masonic age. So there is a lot of Jesus freak talk. If that offends you, then don't click on them. You'll have to wait till we go back to the book of Genesis all over again and redo it. But if it does not offend you and you can eat the inside of the pomegranate and leave the rind, then please take a check out and do and it talks about covenants on covenants about uh hagar and the offended and sarah and the covenant and then the covenant of marriage childhood and childbirth and then the covenants of the land and how we are to give out of the book of leviticus and then it also reviews balaam and laban so oh and the story about laban I'm in, and Jacob and his wives. So, if you would like to check them out, they are there for others to review, and I do hope others will enjoy. Now, we are going to be getting into some more of the verses. Let's continue with Devarim, chapter 26, verse 11. And you are to rejoice in all the good things that Hashem your God has given you and your household. You and the Levite, don't leave them out, okay? And for this point, they, uh, and the Levite means those who do the work and serve the Kohanim. But sometimes they also say Levite and they include the Kohanim in it. So not necessarily the one making and receiving uh, or receiving, sorry, the offerings for the fire and, and the holy food for um, offerings at the tabernacle. These would be those who are assisting those who do the main job of the offerings and receiving of um the guilt offering, the elevation offering, the celebration offering, the the land offering okay these are those who assist those levites because not everyone who was a kohanam and eligible to be a kohanam actually made it to being a kohan or kohan gandar amen all right so even the levite those who work and serve at the tabernacle or wherever in whatever capacity and the sojourner meaning a sojourner someone just visiting the land and they say hey I heard your God is an awesome God. I want to serve him. I want to offer to him. And then we're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But you need to offer to him in a way that he commands, not in a way that you serve your heathen God if you serve heathen gods or no God at all. You need to do it our way because God told us how to do it. And we're to teach those who want to serve him. Do you want to serve him like that? And then they say, absolutely, for sure. And then we go in and we be serving the Lord, right? So, <laughs> this is what that verse means. All the good things that God gives us, we are to enjoy this in it. God wants us to be happy and say, thank you, God, for a beautiful spouse. Thank you, God, for our house. Thank you, God, we have warm water. Thank you, God, that we have a beautiful yard and I can run and play in it with my kids. Even sometimes if my doggy makes a little poopy where I do not want him to poopy. You know what, God? 
thank you that I have a beautiful dog and it's okay because you give me means to buy a pooper scooper and scoop this on up and then we could go out and play and enjoy the day. Thank you God for giving me off time and I can have a picnic with my family. Thank you God that I'm able to walk. Thank you God I'm able to talk. Thank you God for making me a body that works well. Thank you God of, of creation. Thank you for the flowers. Thank you for the fresh rain. Thank you for your promises that are forever. Thank you, almighty God. Hallelujah. God wants us to be happy and to enjoy. I find it a little amusing, though, that God commands us to rejoice in the gifts that he gives us. He doesn't want us to feel guilty for being blessed by God. I know other religions teach that. That you should hate yourself because you have an easy life. Having a quote-unquote easy life or a life without many afflictions is proof that you have lived righteous life repeatedly before the Lord our God and your ancestors had a good relationship with him. This is why God wants you to continue for you to enjoy yourself because you deserve, you have earned, you have earned, excuse me, you have earned through good and faithful righteous service an abundant life here on earth and in the next life most likely i'm i'm positive and i believe god wants you to be blessed hand over fist fist over hand above all higher than the mountains and the treetops in the heavens above i believe this so rejoice for god commands it now other religions religions say that your money isn't yours you need to have everything away be broke busted and disgusted how dare you try to look cute and feel good about yourself and wear well put together shoes and have a well to better house and and want to raise and and want to speak eloquently and actually know math because you're racist right or because you want to uplift your family and do better than the last generation that how some makes you an uncle tom for you loving your country that god put you in that somehow makes you a fascist for you wanting equal law and equal liberty for all that somehow makes you a bigot for you thinking that grown men shouldn't be dancing naked and gyrating and performing mock sexual acts in front of children, well, that makes you a homophobe, you weirdo. No, absolutely not. God said rejoice. And when there is prosperity in a land, he wants you to enjoy it because he put you there for a reason. When there is refreshness in a land, when there is many jobs, when there is prosperity of any kind, justice, righteous leaders, righteous people, that is given to us by faithful service in and of God. Rejoice. Don't forget it. Keep it. Fight for it. Strive for it. This is what God wants. He commands it. God is commanding us not to get down when things don't go our way or give into depression, give into vexation, give into confusion. Don't give into supporting evil or the evil demonic system. That's a part of the vexation. Many lost souls who give in to vexation lose their identity because they no longer identify as a child of God or the title that God has given them. But they begin to identify as anxiety, depression, PTSD, hmm? bipolar, ADHD. God forbid. And no, I'm not a healthcare professional. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not anything with a PhD or a PIMP. I'm not any of that. I'm just a child of God who loves to read and spend time with Hashem. He is my delight, my pleasure, the true love of my life. This is my God. By accepting a negative level of 
label or level onto oneself, that is accepting a curse, accepting a spell conducted by pharmacia, which is witchcraft and sorcery. God forbid. So I suggest to others, based off the word of the only living God, to follow his commands and rejoice in the delights that God has deemed you rightfully to earn. But in receiving this beautiful wealth and this beautiful growth, do not forget God. Rejoice. Be glad. This is good for us to have a joyful heart. For it is written, one of our great many sages, Rabbi Nacham, said in Rabbi Samuel's name, Behold, it is good. Behold, it was good. This refers to the desires, good desires. And behold, it was very good refers to evil desires. It only says very good after man was created with both the good and bad inclinations. In all other cases, it says God saw it and it was good. Can then evil desires be very good? That would be extraordinary. But without the evil desire, however, no man can build a house take a wife, and beget children. Thus said Solomon, Again, I consider all the labor and all the exceedingly in my work that it is man's rivalry with his neighbor. Saku, Suku, Suk, Ka, sorry, 52, 52 A and B. The Gomorrah illustrates the point that it is like this incident. As Ab Abaya once heard a certain man say to a certain woman, Let us rise early and go on the road. Upon hearing this, Abaya said to himself, I will go and oc occupy him and prevent them from violating the prohibition that they certainly intend to violate. He went after him for a distance of three parasags in the marsh among the reeds while they walked on the road, and they did not engage in any wrongful activity. When they were taking leave of each other, he heard that they were saying they will travel a long distance together, and company was pleasant company. He said in that situation, if instead of that man, it had been one who I'm, whom I hate, a euphemism for himself, he would have not been able to restrain himself from sinning. After becoming aware of so great a shortcoming, he went and leaned against the doorpost, thinking and feeling regret. A certain elder came and taught him. Anyone who is greater than another, he, his evil inclination is greater than his. Therefore, Abia said not, should not feel regret, as his realization is a consequence of his greatness. Rabbi Yitzhak said, a person's inclination overcomes him each day, as it is stated, only evil all day. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. All day long his thoughts and desires are for evil. Rabbi Simon bin Lak Lakish said, a person's evil inclination overcomes him each day and seeks to kill him. As it is stated, the wicked watches the righteous and seeks to kill him in Tehillim chapter 37 verse 32. The wicked here is referring to the wickedness inside one's heart. 
And if not for the Holy One, blessed be he, who assists him with good inclination, he would not overcome it as it is stated. The Lord will not leave, hallelujah, the Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor suffer him to be condemned when he is judged. Psalm 37 verse 33. Now the good inclination is us wanting to do good no matter what it is for putting it at the baseline as a general application for others to understand it is our good instincts we have a good instinct when we see someone god forbid trip and fall to run over and be like oh my goodness are you okay can i help you up and it is our first instinct we don't see someone fall well, let me say it this way, where there are others who might see someone fall and they think of saying something snarky like, oh my goodness, that must have hurt. Or they see someone trip and fall and they don't like that person, so they laugh at them and maybe there are a group of kids or a group of um, mongers and they add with the laugh a point and they get others to laugh and point with them. You see what I mean? But a good person, whether they are a person who studies Torah or not, but they have a relationship with God at some spiritual level, they see someone fall, God forbid, and they rush over and want to help them. Even if that person is someone they previously didn't like. Even if that person is somebody that doesn't look like something like them. Even if that person is someone who done did them wrong in the past. They see them fall and they're like, oh my goodness. They are at their most vulnerable state right now. I am not an Amalek. You hear this? I am not an Amalek. I am a child of the living God. Commanded by him. That when I see someone at their weakness to not be an Amalek and attack them from behind. Not to shame them, not to belittle them, not to embarrass them in public. But run to them and ask, are you okay? Can I help you up? That is the difference between those who know God, whether they share the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or not. Those are those who hearken unto his voice. That leading, that guiding. Some call it the good inclination. Some will say um, the spirit of God working in them, moving them to do good. Some will say whatever label they have been taught to put it under and understand it as. But it's basically this. It's the voice of God speaking to you it is god's beautiful holy angel saying move it's your time to do good this is your mitzvah to act on the evil inclination god forbid is that disgusting foul demonic angel saying haha point and laugh at them there's your enemy be an amalek give in to vexation of it Give in to an evil inclination. Point and laugh. Get others to join in with you so they feel like a victim. Put them down. You see the difference between someone who knows good or not God? Who kno some, uh, You see the difference between someone who knows God and doesn't know God? God's covenant is of the heart. Not of the pocketbook or of the genitals. Let's continue. Portion of a portion, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12 through 15. When you finish tithing, giving that 10% of the abundance that God has given you, the things in your life that bring you joy, whether it's from your garden or from your pocketbook or from your marriage or from your children or from the abundance of your clothes or um, maybe got abundance of I don't know, fishing rods <laughs> or hunting uh, items or backpacking gear or shoes. You know, you got an abundance of white button down shirts because you're so firm, you know. 
When you finish tidying all the tides of your presence, of your produce, and the third year, because we keep time, right? Right? We are righteous before the Lord. We started marking the third year out of your abundance, the year of the tithe, you are to give. You are to give. Don't be a miser. <laughs> give to the Levite and to the sojourner. But God, they're not a Jew. Why should I give to someone just traveling in and out, living among the Jewish people? Their mother isn't even Jewish. Their father isn't even Jewish. Their last name don't end with Goldberg or Geinstein or, or what. No, no, no. See, that's the difference between someone who has a relationship with God or not. God is about a relationship. I want others to hear this. This is why we went over Devarim chapter 28, first verses 1 through 14. The blessings are for those who hearken unto the voice of God. God is saying, and the sojourner. So we should listen, right? Amen. You are to give to the Levite and to the sojourner and to the orphan and to the widow that they may eat within your gates. What? And be satisfied? Yes. And you are to say before the presence of the almighty and only living God, I have removed the most holy part of my house. I have also given to the Levite and the sojourner and the orphan and the widow exactly as you, Almighty God, have commanded me. I have not crossed over away from your commandments, no. I have not forgotten, I have not eaten of what was in sorrow. I have not removed of it white tamid, meaning anything um, unclean, un uh, leprosy, uh, anything um, deemed uh, an abomination. I have not done this, right? I have not. I have not tricked or sickened anything. I have not given anything of it to the dead. I have hearkened to the voice of Hashem, my God. I have done exactly as you have commanded me, Lord. Look down from your beautiful, holy abode from heaven and bless your people, Israel. I did the work, Lord. I was tended to your laws. I went over every single thing. But this blessing that I ask of is not just for me, but for all your people, Israel. Bless your people, Israel, and bless the land that you give us. As I swear to your fathers, the land flowing with milk and honey. So if others want to know why those of us in dysphoria, how much control we have over the world, if we aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing, it affects those living in Israel. I know some don't want to believe it. But it is true, just like what those in Israel do, those in Jerusalem, those what do and what is supposed to be the land of uh, our forefathers that our merciful Hashem promised to our forefathers. Just like what they do and the prayers that they pray and the teachings that they teach and the Shabbats that they keep and the festivals that they keep and the commandments that they keep. Just like their beautiful observances affect the whole entire world. Our gravity, our weather, our seasons, we affect them. Now, they are a smaller portion, very, very small and lesser in number, but that's the way God works. And what they do there in that beautiful land may we soon be there. Affects the whole world. And then it takes the whole world full of whatever righteous people from all four corners of the earth. Us working and doing our best in conjunction, right? With one mind for the only living God. For Israel to be blessed. Now there's a lot of troubles going on. 
all over the world. Now, I'm going to suggest something radical that a lot of us aren't doing what we could be doing. You see what I mean? A lot of us are not doing as much as we could be doing. Now, this knowing if you are up to the level of what you're supposed to be doing for Hashem and the nation of Israel and Israel for the rest of the world is going to take a little bit of self-reflection and a little bit self-judging. Uh, some, uh, you know, Musar. Taking upon yourself, taking a review, rebuking yourself, asking God to weigh and judge you so that you might be able to live out his correction. And believe you me, you want to be judged by God. I know some teach you don't want to be judged by God, but it is better to be judged by God than by men, for it is written. So this season, while the king is in the field and you are your beloved and your beloved is yours, while you are praying your Tehillim, why not pray the one where it says, Search me, O God. Seek me. Find me. Weigh me. For your commandments are pure. And you bring wicked upon the wicked and righteous upon the righteous. Judge me. We want God's correction, especially before the Day of Atonement. <laughs> I'm just saying, get it done and get it over with, right? It's a shorter amount of time than the rest of the year. I'm just saying. A little spiritual teaching. <laughs> it's good to ask and check in with God. God, am I, am I doing all that you've asked me? Could I be doing more? Where could I be doing more? Amen? Amen. Now, what is Tamid? Okay, so tell me to something that is ritually unclean or something that is ritually impure. For example, we could never take, it would never be a good thing. It would never be kosher. It would never be uh, in agreement with God's word for us to take something that is not of God um, to a synagogue, right? Because that's a synagogue. That's the place where God's beautiful Shekinah is supposed to dwell with us and, and us with him. Okay. We are never supposed to take anything that is uh, unkosher food, not permitted, not um, not. Uh, how do you say the word? I'm I'm searching for the word. Hold on. Something that is not approved for spiritual uplifting of the soul, according to Jewish law. To a Jewish household that you know is a kosher house. Not all Jews eat kosher. Okay, some 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 don't. So if you know someone is doing their best to be firm, you know someone's doing their best to be orthodox, someone's doing their best even if they're not orthodox, if they're reformed or liberal, but they keep kosher, and you take something unkosher to their house, you have gone against what God has prescribed. You have actually tried to, God forbid, um, bring someone into uncleansiness and make them ritually impure, and that's obviously a big no-no, <laughs> okay? So a person or object that is in contact with anything that is tamur, ta, tuma, or tamir, something that is ritually impure, they have to go to a whole process, which we talked about before, about how to re themselves or the object, depending on what it is, if it can be kosherized. Now, anything that is porous cannot be kosherized. I know someone's out there going to be like, Marie, humans are porous. How do we kosherize ourselves? Mikvah it up, right? Mikvah it up and atonement it up and go before the Lord our God so you can be spiritually clean. Remove yourself from the city and from the area. Be seven days outside the city and go back in, get weighed and judge. If you're clean or if you're not clean, come back out. If you're not clean, go back in, right? Mikvah it up, right? So impurity, impurity, and I got this from, I believe, Chabad.org. I'll double check. But here's the author's name, Susan Handelman. Okay. She did a beautiful article that I found about the essence, meaning the spirituality of ritually impure. Now, Hasidic 
teaching explains that essence of tumah, ritually impurity, is defined as absence of holiness. Absence of holiness is to be absence of life. Life is God. So it is, unfortunately, through an act or through a deed or through um, getting into something that God deemed uh, an abomination and unclean, whether it is an act, whether it is a talk, whether it is a living situation or a deed, that is giving into unholiness and someone can become ritually tuma or spiritually tuma or physically tuma okay on the other hand a source <coughs> oh excuse me so <coughs> I apologize for that. My dog is barking. Someone can become physically, ritually impure. For example, when, God forbid, they touch a dead body. If they were not appointed, you know, to be in the investigation party. Remember, we talked about the um, Kohanam, those who were specifically tasked to do the investigations of, God forbid, a dead body was found in between the city. And then they do the whole mess uh, measuring and then they do the whole prayers and ceremony and properly burying the dead. Remember this? Okay, let's say God didn't appoint you to be one of these Kohanam who are tasked with doing the investigation situation and burying the dead body and you come upon and touch it okay tamud is a quick uh tama tuma excuse me is equivalent to being separated from god which is equivalent to a spiritual impurity of death okay these are the forces of evil kabbalists and hasidic terminology the shitra uh, hakra, the other side. This outside or the other side is far away from God's presence and holiness. This is a place of sadness, a place of despair, a place of depression. This is where PTSD comes from. This is where shocks and traumas come from. This is, uh, no, I'm not a doctor or healthcare professional. I'm just talking about the spirituality from, from. This is where it comes through splits in the soul, splits in a spirit for someone. And if it isn't filled with the righteousness of the Lord, it could lead to deeper sorrows and woes one giving into vexation the holiness is synonymous with the brit tumur it is it has no sense of any true existence independent of god meaning if you have holiness you have god if you have righteousness you have the presence of god this is why our sages tell us arrogance is equivalent to idolatry. So if you have arrogance, if you have mob mentality, thinking you and your numbers can overrule someone, thinking you could get away with criminality, thinking you could get away with bullying or oppression, that is linked to idolatry because it is linked to arrogance and haughtiness. All right. That is tumah. It is unclean, it is ritually and spiritually unclean. And any individual that is a part of a priesthood or rabbiship, um, and they are instructing at a synagogue and they are currently engaged in anything that is tumach, guess what they are doing? Taking the Lord or God name in vain, and they are putting themselves, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid, under you guessed it, the Kedek Sin. The Kedek Sin, which we spoke about yesterday, which means they're putting themselves in line to die before the age 65. That's sad, right? Oh, God forbid, God forbid, God forbid. May we all repent and return to Hashem this season. Amen and amen. Now, God doesn't require us to be perfect. We saw Judah 
We talked about Judah and Tamar yesterday, right? They all did some deeds. <laughs> they did some deeds. But we can all repent and return to Hashem. And this is the season to do that. So I'm going to continue to press that until the Day of Atonement. Repent. Repent. Turn away from evil and learn to do good. Seek the face of Hashem. Now, the soul rises higher as we engage in freedom of choice. And we use that choice to deepen our relationship with God. We remove the Tamud or the Tamid issues, the uncleanliness, the spiritual impurities from our lives as we read and study more and more Torah. Torah cleanses the soul. Reading Tehillims cleanses the soul. Reading the Proverbs gives wisdom and brings righteousness righteousness excuse me because all of that is consistent with the true beautiful mind of the living God. Many believe that the uncleansiness has to do with something towards women. So we'll address it because there's always feminists out there willing to pervert, degrade women, and put down God's relationship with women. But we've talked about this before. And I'm going to reiterate it. And this isn't to put down men. But spiritually speaking, women are superior to men. So women don't ever... Men, please don't hate me. God protect me. Amen. <laughs> Women should never lower themselves to be a man. The whole feminist movement was about a woman lowering herself, enfranchising herself, incorporating femininity, turning it into feminism for Profit, monies, and gain. So that she no longer becomes a spiritual being circumcised from birth in the womb to have a relationship with Almighty God. No. After feminism, women were able to be taxed. Marie, but women could then vote and own land. Well, they could do that before then. Do you not remember? Really? You don't remember. You want to accept the challenge. Well, challenge accepted. Was there ever a time before the women's feminist movement and women's suffrage movement that women went to college in America? Were women educated in America before this? Were women able to sustain and provide on their own and be business owners before the feminist movement? Before women's suffrage? Think about it. Were women able to do and be more free and were not accountable under as many laws as men before the feminist movement? Think about this. The answer is yes. What the feminist movement did is they took women out of femininity and being superior to men. And it actually made them lower than men. It made women slaves double of a man. You know how it happened? Because women actually, sadly, fought to become slaves. Oh, that is painful to realize, isn't it? Women fought through the feminist movement to become slaves. To become sexual objects. To become able to be taxed. Before this, women weren't being taxed. You see? Women fought to lose their independence. I challenge others to go and research great women of 
the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s, and the early 1900s before the women's suffrage movement. You will read about women who were queens, women who were not queens, and they still held governmental positions, specifically in France and in other places in Europe. You will read and hear about the 12th, 10th, 9th, 10th, Indigenous people of those centuries were women were held the higher leadership positions above men. This is what you will read if you do some research and search some history and stop buying into the lies of the feminist movement. Stop buying into the lies that because you're a woman you are oppressed and your only freedom is through your vagina and being over sexualized and showing your body parts to anyone and walking around half naked. That's not empowerment. In fact, in biblical times, to wear more fabric was a sign of wealth. Go ask a seamstress. <laughs> You ever wonder why dressing modest and buying a dress is more expensive than buying quote unquote fash fashion? Because fast, cheap, revealing fashion is just that. Fast and cheap. When God called you to be something more than that, women, he made you according to his will. He made you spirit. Think about this. I challenge other women to return to the ways of Hashem. To remove the feminists and take up your femininity. To take up you being a woman of God. Now, men who love God are probably cheering right now saying, yes, we want godly women again. Godly women want other godly women too. Believe you me, I know this. Godly women want other, other godly women too. And believe me, God wants his women to return back to being godly, to raising our kids with morals with sound minds, with confidence, and being there for them every step of the way. God wants this, and it is agreement with his word. Being Tamid or Tuma of Nida, which goes into the laws of a woman's cycle, and the feminist movement perverted this about Judaism and said it is, a woman is unclean and a nasty thing and inferior and degraded and sinful. No, 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 that is not it. I'll tell you what it was. Before a woman's monthly cycle, she had the opportunity to be a part of an earthly creation of life. And God said, shall we make those in our image? She had a part to be, yes, if she is under the covenant of marriage. She would have been acting in God's will to come and become one with her husband under laying down in a beautiful ceremony of creating life. And God would have had the opportunity from her being together with her husband to put a beautiful life in the fruit of her womb. And she was going to be able to bring forth one of her firstborn or one of her children and bring that beautiful product of her womb to the priest and say, I want to dedicate my child to the service of God. But if she is not married... Or if it just wasn't a time for things to happen, because God knows all. God knows everything. Her monthly cycle would come forth. And that would have been the Tuma period of Nida. Where, for some reason that is beyond our knowing, instead of a life being produced in the spiritual realm a death happened 
because a woman is born with her eggs. We remember anatomy class, right? A woman is born with the possibility of making her children at birth. Okay? So she's born with these children. And for a rooted reason, the life doesn't come forth. So if there isn't life, there is death. Remember, we talked about cause and effect yesterday. So for that period that there is death, being under the laws of removing oneself from the city, then after the period of the menstruation happens, she has to be outside of the city, which for a married woman, her city is her husband. That is her tribe. That is her connection to the nation. That We're putting it all together now? Amen. So she has to be separated from her husband for that time period. I believe it's... Um, well, it depends on your cycle. So, you know, women know their cycle. I'm just going to say the medical um, generality terms. It's 12 to 14 days, right? Then she goes through the mikvah. She recultures herself. For lack of better words, she becomes untalmid. She has uh, familiar spirits removed from her. She has uncleanness removed from her because if there is death there is the existence of familiar spirits because they are not alive after the mikvah process all those uh tamid spirits are removed from her the death spirits that are allowed the cycle to happen and she re-emerges from the mikvah rejoins supernaturally and spiritually back to life with Hashem she could then go back to her husband that night saying ah went through the mikvah it's party time okay or I shouldn't say it that way forgive me it's time to come back together as one and have the possibility of creating a life through the holy uh, covenant of marriage amen amen this is what happens so it isn't a way to beat down women is our point okay so let's continue with a portion of a portion. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 16 through 19. This day. What day? I said uh, this day. Hallelujah. This day, Hashem, your God, commands you to observe dun, 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 these laws and these regulations. Yes. Don't, don't say you don't remember. Do you remember what laws and regulations we went over? <laughs> Pop quiz, do you remember what we went over for the last two hours? If not, I understand. It happens. And that's why God tells us to study His Torah every year, all years. Amen? So we can get it ingrained in us. All right. So remember and observe these laws and these regulations that you are to take care and observe them with what? All your heart. Not with all your pocketbook or with all your body parts uh, your genitalia okay i'm trying to be i'm trying to be politically halfway correct at least decent right some people think that their body parts will get them into the house of god it doesn't work this way he he's not the god with a little g he's the great and powerful god all right he wants your heart so with all your heart and with all your beings all all your efforts all your intention hashem you have declared today to be for you a God because he is your God. Do this when you are walking in his ways and keeping his laws, his commandments, his regulations, and what? Hearken unto his voice, his breath. When you are walking and you feel a gush of wind, God is trying to speak to you. Turn around, say, I am here, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Lord, I am here. I want to hear your will. Do you believe God will answer you? I believe he will. I believe he will. Why? Because God has declared to you today. And you have declared to God that you are to be with him. And you are to be for him. Why? Because you are his special treasured people you are the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn why because you know god and you call him by name and he has promised you 
to be careful regarding all his commandments with you and for you. And you have promised him. He has set you most high above all the nations. Why? Because you know his name. He has set you above all these nations that he has made for praise, for fame, for honor, for you are to be his people, the people of the holy living God. You, Israel, you, the journeyer living among the nation of Israel, you, the orphan, hallelujah, and you, the widow, spoken about in this chapter, God promised that you are his treasured and holy person. Think about that. That's relationship. That isn't religion. You hear this? The nation of Israel, the sojourner who knows God and wants to serve him and offer your best to him that he has given you, the orphan and the widow, the abandoned, the left behind, the not taken care of properly, the not loved right, the not treated fairly, the looked down upon, those born at a disadvantage, those born with deficiencies, hurt, and woes. God set you up to be praised for knowing Him. He set you up to be honored. For you are his holy people, his holy person, as he has promised. How beautiful that is, <laughs> right? Oh, God, I love you. And you can see here why God hates the arrogant, because they think they got it simply because of a bloodline, simply because of what's in their bank account, simply because they own this or have that degree, as if they earned it on their own, as if God didn't somehow make it happen for them. Do you think God gives us things because? We are just so awesome. No, 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 no. God gives us what he gives us, not for our righteousness sake, but for his righteousness sake. God gives us what he gives us because we need to earn it. Because it is built on a foundation of his commandment. He rewards us with great things because the wicked have forfeited the great things because they chose to rebel and go against the living God. Blessings of Deuteronomy chapter 28 are for everyone who knows his name and hearkens unto his voice. Oh, yes. And curses are for anyone who choose to go against the only living God. This month is the month of Ewu. When I wrote this blog, it was coming up, but now it is here. Some of us have started making teshuva, which means changing about our ways, removing the tamur, the tamir, removing the unclean things, the unclean words, the unclean practices, the unclean items from our house, from our persons, from our behaviors, from our deeds, from our acquaintances, from our friends, from our relationships, from our workplace, from our businesses. Some of us already started doing this. And some of us are going to start today, may it be. Now God is reaching out and he wants to touch every and anyone's nefesh who is willing to connect with him. Spirit to spirit. Breath to breath. Life to life. Appetite to appetite for the righteous things. Do you hunger for freedom in Hashem? Do you hunger for the peace that only the Lord our God can bring? Well, if you do, I found a great video about how to make teshuva. This is a part one portion. I've watched a couple of the teachings of Rabbi Alon. I like them. I love them. I want some more of them. And it is a beautiful spiritual teachings. There are some mystical teachings in it. So if you are or have been a member of this uh, Bible study, I think you might enjoy it. 
there is a part two and I want to say even a part three or part four but um it's been a while since I searched probably a week or two and I might be getting that up with someone else's teachings so I know there is at least a part two so search this out maybe watch the video if you are so inclined I think you might like it but if you are not a video watcher you are a reader and I love reading I love books there are several books that you can check out on uh, the Sephora.org website, books about Teshuva or articles about Teshuva. You can order some of them in hard copy if you would like. The links are on that website. And, or you can check out this article, which I linked before, which basically shows how to properly observe El Ul. Now, if you are someone who knows God, calls him by name, and you are a sojourner, meaning you are living in a state in a nation in a community where there happens to be a synagogue you are a sojourner and you're living amongst the jews and that gives you the opportunity to turn to the only living god make your choice about observing his commandments or not but at least you can observe his festivals and his feasts and get closer to him because it is about a relationship this is what the torah teaches and which we have gone over in the last lessons all right so, how to observe the month of Eul. I suggest to those who are not thinking of converting to Judaism itself and you just want to observe Eul, um, read the Tehillims, specifically chapter 27 every day, and do your daily prayers. That's it. Dedicating to you, your life to God and finishing your prayer only in his name. Hashem, the great I am. And be specific and say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the great and mighty awesome God. Thank you, Hashem. Amen. Don't end your prayers in anyone else's name because that is idolatry. That's the bare minimum. That's how you can and should observe this month of Oul. If you are a Ben Noak, um... Or if you are someone who's interested in converting, maybe you've been thinking about it sometime, I suggest going into Rabbi Google and searching for your nearest and closest Orthodox synagogue. Or you can search for a synagogue, a Reformed or a liberal one, wherever you feel comfortable to get the ball rolling and going because everyone has to start from somewhere. Do not get trapped up in the Masonic ones because we went over that yesterday. That is a set of Christianity, Rome 325, which is not in agreement with God. All right, so right now the king is in the field. It is the month of Eul. You're more than welcome to check out um, this uh, article, which says to read uh, the Tehillim chapter 24 morning and afternoon prayers for those who want to observe uh, if you have a shofar to sound the horn if you do not have a shofar you can raise up your praises and worship in whatever in instrument you play to god okay if, if you are not a jew okay you raise and you pray with a harp, with a lyre, with a piano, with a guitar, or you merely sing even if you can't carry a tune. You pray to the only living God. Amen. You can write a letter of kindness and, and blessings to others. Reach out, send greetings, send cards. If you know that someone has been in need, maybe they're needing a new mattress, or you've noticed that their child started school and and they were they mentioned like oh my goodness i don't know how i'm gonna buy you know new shoes for my kid or school supplies this is the time and this is the season that we could use um acts of kindness and it's like to the tenth fold like you bought some paper some pencils and um i don't know folders for a student you know for someone you knew who wouldn't be able to afford school supplies it's as if you bought school supplies for a whole university in a whole district of school that's how much doing acts of kindness count for this time amen now those who are recommitting their um self to hashem 
maybe they fell away from a while from Judaism, but now they're filling that pool to reconnect. Um, contact your local synagogue. Go speak to your rabbi. Say, you know, I'm feeling this pool. I want to I wanna be back with Hashem. I want to get right. You know, I felt a little bit com- uncomfortable before, but I want to ease myself into it. Do you have any suggestions how I may do so? Always seek the guidance of your rabbis at the synagogue, specifically or Orthodox synagogues. Okay, this is my unprofessional recommendation. All right. All right. So those who are, are observant Jews, you know what to do. So you don't need my suggestions. But um, yeah, recommend ourselves to God because this is the time to do it. The kink is in the field. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine amen and amen hallelujah that concludes this hallelujah round of applause <laughs> um in this bible study for today we went over deuteronomy chapter 26 call out to hashem your god and armenian tried to destroy my father oh hashem mm, blessed be your name we are going to close with a blessing after reading the torah We'll do a quick blessing for everyone out there. And then I will see you all, God willing, very, very soon for Deuteronomy chapter 27. And then Deuteronomy chapter 28, where we will go over the curses of those who choose not to hearken unto the voice of the Lord our God. Blessing of the Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord our God, who gives the Torah. Oh, I love you, Hashem. Amen. Woo! Oh, Hashem is so wonderful. Friendly reminder, the half Torah for this portion that we just started today is Isaiah chapter 60. Oh, that's a good one. I encourage others to check it out and read it. And read your Tehillim. Search out the month of it. We'll figure out how to observe, which is appropriate to your relationship with God. Amen and amen. So till next time, children of the Most High, ever loving and living God, may Hashem bless you and keep you. May his glorious, beautiful, holy, wonderful face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may he give you his peace. And may we all forever be written in the book of life. Amen and amen.